Is there anything in your way of following Jesus? We'll start with the question. Um, How about like, is there anything that's hindering your relationship with the Lord? I think if you kind of look at that question, I think a lot of us would give that Sunday school answer of no, like nothing's in the way. Like he's my everything and I, I, I trust in him with, with all of me. But I, I think the reality is, is when the world hits us and things happen or well, whether it's real in the moment or maybe something that's out there and it's like, oh, that would be so great. I, I think there's times where these things kind of get in the way of our relationship with the Lord, of really, really following Jesus with everything that we have. So today we are in week 23. Yes, I'm not great in math, but that seems like a long time. It's like half the year working through the book of Mark. And I do want to say this real quick. It's kind of a commercial break. We're going to press pause on this series, working through the book of Mark. And beginning next week, we're going to join life groups as they are kind of unpacking what does it mean to be one anothering. We're going to do that for four weeks and then two week vision casting series talking about what family church is going to look like in the future. And at the beginning of November, we'll be back in the book of Mark. So we're going to take about six weeks of kind of doing a couple other things and then come back and and work through that book of Mark. So we are in uh, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. Um, So back to the original question of, is there anything that's in the way of you following Jesus? I've worked with students for quite some time and Young people, for the most part, they can be pretty open and honest about that type of question. A lot of times they say, I don't want to take things too serious right now. Like I'm only young once and I really want to have fun. At some point when I become an adult, then like I'm going to put everything into this relationship with Jesus. I I think some adults, like we have this tendency to go, I really want to pursue God with everything, but I also want to experience the good life or, or maybe like uh, work hard enough to have a big enough nest so that when I retire, then I'm able to do some things I'm unable to do now. So at the detriment of possibly my faith and at the detriment of possibly my family, I'm going to work super hard so that I can have the good life. And, and I also think on the idea of this, missionary life that uh, here at Family Church, we're big on missions. And so we hear about these mission trips or, or being part of the mission field. And we think, you know what, that would be so great. I'd love to do that, but I don't have the time and, and I, I don't have the money. And so maybe just maybe at some point down the road, it will happen. But right now, just life is just too much. Now we've all have moments and I'm not trying to hurt anybody with these statements, but I think we've all have moments where we really want to pursue Jesus with everything that we are, but there are some things that pop up um, in our lives. And, and, And for a lot of us, we really love the blessings and sometimes it's hard to pursue the giver of those blessings. So the question again for you is what do you tend to place in front of Jesus? Now, kind of recap where we've been at the last few weeks in in the book of Mark is Jesus is teaching, he's preaching, he's doing healings, he's doing all these amazing things. He had a difficult conversation about divorce. And then he actually, I'm sure it was an awkward moment where he rebukes the disciples when their uh, families are trying to bring their children in front of Jesus so he could bless them. And the disciples are kind of pushing them away. And I'm sure that was a little bit awkward. And all of a sudden, this this young man runs up to Jesus and he kneels before him, okay? And so he asks a question that seems like a pretty wise question, a question I think that we all are kind of curious about, is what must I do to inherit eternal life? Again, it sounds like a wise question. He's going to Jesus. It seems like he's going to the right place to ask this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But the problem with this question is that his heart wasn't in the right place. So in chapter, or excuse me, chapter 10, verse 17, 
It says, and as he talked about Jesus, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know, the commandments do not murder, do not, do not commit adultery. Jesus says, he goes on and says, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, this young man said to Jesus, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. So the first thing I want to draw attention to is I have done. I have done. Again, verse 17, it says, this young man ran up and knelt before him. Now, culturally speaking, this is not something that is a normal thing that happens, especially for dignified men, let alone men, but dignified men. Like this is not something that they would do. See, dignified people wore tunics and in order to run, they'd have to hike up their tunic, expose the bottom half of their leg and run so they don't trip and fall. And not only does he do that, but he kneels before Jesus it says he knelt before him and apparently giving respect and honor to Jesus. That this is the things that he's doing, which is culturally speaking, not something that's the normal kind of thing that happens. But then he calls Jesus good teacher. He says, good teacher. Not only does he run, not only does he kneel, not only does he do these things, but he calls him good. He doesn't call him just teacher. He doesn't just call him rabbi. He calls him good teacher. Again, culturally speaking, in the Jewish culture, they, would, they didn't call anyone good because God is the only one who is good. So this man is essentially calling Jesus God. He's saying, good teacher. Again, these all seem like positive things. Like he's going to Jesus. He's asking the question. And he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The problem with this Jewish man, like even though he seems or appears that he's doing the right things, the problem is, is that he thinks it's about himself. He says, what must I I do? What can I do? Is there something I'm missing? Is, is there a rule I'm not following? Am I, am I, how am I not measuring up well enough? What can I do? What can I achieve? This man appears to love the law of God more than the son of God. He, he appears that he loves the law that God gave instead of the son of God. But why is this troubling? Why? Again, the idea seems like it's there, but there's something missing. Why is this troubling? It's because this action can make you think that you don't need God, that you could work your way up to him by doing good things over and over and over, by, by adhering to the law as best as you can, that you could just get by just good enough, that you really don't need God, that you can achieve eternal life all on your own. Moving on in, in verse 18, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus here isn't denying his deity. He's not denying that he is God in the flesh. He's wanting this man to reflect upon what he just called Jesus. Why he says, why do you call me good? And he points back to God. He said, no one is good except God alone. This man in today's world, or, or excuse me, in that world, appears to do some good things. Like he, he, he has possessions. He's young. Uh, as I'm getting a little bit older, when somebody's younger, it's like, hey, they got some things going on. They don't wake up. You know, uh, right now I have plantar fasciitis. And so I have to hobble more than I used to. And so it appears that this man has some good things going for him. He seems religious. He seems respectful. He seems like he's seeking out that he may even be himself important as a rich young ruler. 
But Jesus is wanting him to see God, not his own contributions. And Jesus asks him that question. And before this man even has a chance to respond, and he says, no one is good except God alone. He goes to the commandments. He says, you know, the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Now these six have to do with peopling well, like it's living in community and how to love and honor each other well. And one of these six isn't actually in Exodus chapter 20 with the 10 commandments is this do not defraud. Now, there's a few different theologians that kind of debate why Jesus says this. And some say it could be a rewording of do not covet. But there's also some theologians that believe that maybe this is how this young man was able to acquire his possessions and his wealth. Because potentially maybe he defrauded someone or, pe- or, or a bunch of other people. Whatever the case, I want you to hear this. Jesus isn't expecting the sinful man to gain eternal life on his own works. He's reminding humanity of their need of a savior because you cannot do all of these on your own. And the reality is we cannot gain eternal life on our own. We need Jesus again and again and again. We need Jesus and then this man says, teacher, I've kept all of these since my youth. I kept them from my youth. To quote my, my father, uh, Roger, he would, anytime you, somebody would say something to this degree, he'd always go, really? Like, like really? You've done all of these. We'll go back to it. You've done all of these since your youth. Like you're, you have never like potentially gotten mad at your mom and dad, didn't honor them well. You've never lied. You've never defrauded anyone. You've kept all of these. Really? Now, I, I think this young man is saying, you know, I thought maybe there was something else. Like I know these things. I know all of these things. And so I'm hoping that maybe you have insight in something else or something that I'm missing. Clearly he's keenly aware he's missing something. And so he goes to Jesus. But what I notice, teacher, I've kept all of these things is I don't see repentance. I, I don't see any confession that he's fallen short because I believe that this man really felt he was doing the best that he can. And in our world, it's essentially saying, I'm pretty good. Like, I'm a pretty good person. I, 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 I don't cheat on my taxes. I, I don't cheat on my spouse. I go to church as much as possible. Like I may not be perfect, but I'm pretty good. Like I call my mom on Sundays. And if by chance I miss that Sunday, that coming week, I'm calling her twice to make up for that time I missed. It's essentially saying I'm pretty good. Like I'm okay. I'm a good person. The problem with these statements is that All of them begin with I, and none of them begin with Jesus. Jesus died for me. Jesus took on my sin and my shame. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is love. None of those statements that we make, and as well as this man had make, had anything to do with Jesus, had everything to do about himself. Jesus knew that we couldn't do this on our own and that we needed a savior. Jesus did what I could not do. This man was looking for a new step that he's maybe missing something. And he has a weak view of his own sin and has a weak view of who Jesus really is. He sees him as a good teacher, but he does not see him as God in the flesh. So for you, are there places in your life where you think I'm good enough? Are there places in your life where you think I'm good enough? I'm good enough to get to heaven. 
God loves me enough and, and, and his grace is so big and so wide. I, I am good enough. I'm good enough to stand before a holy and righteous judge. I am good enough. Jesus wants this young man to see how to surrender to Jesus, to surrender everything to him. In verses 21 and 22, it says, And Jesus, looking at him, he loved him and said to him, You lack one thing, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus does something that's very contrary to how I would have responded, especially with the statement of like, we, I've done all of these things. Jesus looks at him and he loves him. He looks at this young man and he loves him. He doesn't condemn him. He, he doesn't uh, um, yell at him. He doesn't uh, say threatening words. To him. He doesn't verbally assault him. What he does is he sees him and he loves him. And what a king, what a savior who sees him at his mess, but still willing to love him well. Jesus says, you lack one thing, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have your treasure in heaven. And, and then come follow me. I wonder at this first part, it says, you lack one thing. I wonder if he's like, okay, here's the missing piece. Ah, okay, I'm ready for it. And Jesus tells him the thing that he's holding in place in front of Jesus, in front of God in the flesh. He's holding back his wealth. That's what he has that he's unwilling to give up. That's what he has that he's unwilling to to put aside, to follow Jesus with everything. Now, this, this passage isn't calling people to live in poverty. That's not what this passage is about. This passage is Jesus is pointing to the area that he has a hard time giving up. Culturally, wealth means that you're blessed by God. I'm sure this young man is thinking, you know, I apparently I'm doing something right here. I'm being blessed by God with all of this wealth. And now you're asking me to give it up. What I also love about this passage is right here. Jesus asked him to come follow me in spite of it all. Jesus knows this man's heart in spite of it all. He's asking him to come follow me. But this man does something different. It says, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful. Now in the gospels, most people who encounter Jesus <clears throat> walk away transformed and joyful. They, they walk away like not the same person as they came. This man walks away different as well, but disheartened and sorrowful because this man rejected Jesus. He, he came with a, a, a humble kind of beginning where he bows before him, but he's not with a humble heart. He has no humble heart because he loved his wealth more than he loved obeying Jesus. You see, I see a heart, uh, a heartbreak here. In verse 21, you see the tenderness of Jesus. He looks at him and he loves him. And he asked him to come follow me. And in verse 22, you see tragedy where the man walks away saddened and sorrowful. The question I think is relevant to this for you is does your behavior show that you desire a good life over eternal life? But how do you receive eternal life? What, what does that look like? What, how, how does this even begin? It's admitting that you are a sinner. It's admitting that you can't do this on your own. It's believing. It's believing that, that God left perfection for you, that he left heaven for you. And because of that, he, he lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. And he so willingly died on the cross for you and for me and to believe that he is the son of God and that he came back from the dead. 
And it's also to confess, to confess that um, you have faith that is found in Christ. This is how you receive eternal life. Do you believe eternal life is better than your earthly desire? Jesus then circles back to this need of a savior in verses 23 through 27. It says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it would be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. And they said to him, then who can be saved? Like if, if a rich guy can't do it, like who can be saved? And Jesus says, he looks at them with man. It is impossible, but not with God for all things are possible with God. Did you catch it? It is impossible for man. It is impossible for man. Jesus begins with saying something that is contrary to the culture and what's been taught for years and years and years. He says, how difficult it would be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now there is a need that we all have and and wealthy people have a tendency to not necessarily feel that need, it seems like, where maybe they could buy something to kind of place in front of that need or, or buy a lot of things to kind of place the need that we all have. Now, I, I know that when we see this, the, the wealth as Americans, we have a tendency to think that we're not really that wealthy, that, that we're actually kind of poor or that we're barely getting by financially speaking. But if you go to a website called givingwhatwecan.org, you can kind of see, statistically speaking, if you put your household income to see what that measures up with the rest of the world. And so a couple numbers that I put in just for the sake of putting it in. If you, if your household makes $40,000 a year, you make more than 80% of the entire world's population. If you make $80,000 as, as a household, you make over 90% of what everyone else makes around the world. You see here in America, we are wealthy. And because of that wealth, it can be hard to see our need for Christ. But this need isn't a need that you can buy. It's a need that you need to receive, that you must receive. Acknowledge where you fall short, where you need a savior. Repent and believe and you'll receive eternal life. Verse 21, Jesus doubles down. He says, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this children uh, statement is actually different than last week when Pastor Craig was walking through. Uh, This children is not in terms of infancy and babies, which was what last week's was. This children is more of a term of endearment. He's saying, listen to me, child. Listen to me. It is difficult and it's hard to enter. And oftentimes rabbis would say something kind of ridiculous And uh, just to kind of catch the attention, I think even as teachers, whether you're in the public school, private school system, um, for me, when I'm teaching students, sometimes I say things ridiculous just to see for one, if they're paying attention. And Jesus says something that seems kind of crazy. He says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, an average camel can grow up to 11 feet tall. Now, I don't know how big a needle is, but it seems quite impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And and by saying this, I'm sure there might have been some laughter or something to be like, what is he saying? He's talking about the impossibility it is. And they're thinking if a rich man can't get in, I don't stand a chance. There's no way I can get in if a rich man who's blessed by God can't even get in. And Jesus flips the script. And he says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God for all things are possible with God. Salvation is something man cannot accomplish on his own, no matter how much money you have or how little money you have. No matter if you have a life of convictions, a life of morals, if you do not have Christ as your savior, 
you will not enter into eternal life. No matter how good of a person you are, no matter how much you really honor people around you, Jesus points them back to God for all things are possible with God. Apart from grace, this law abiding Jewish man has no hope. Apart from grace, you and I have no hope. It's like Jesus is reminding them of the previous teaching, this idea of childlike faith. It doesn't matter how much influence you have, how much intelligence you have. It doesn't matter any of those things. What matter is receiving salvation that is only found in Christ. And that is it. Then Jesus tells his disciples their eternal reward. He says, uh, Peter asked the question. He says, see, we have left everything and we're following you. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Peter, if you're familiar with who Peter is, he he oftentimes the first one to say something. He asks the question. He says, we've left everything and followed you. Notice Jesus doesn't get after Peter. Doesn't get angry at him. He doesn't rebuke him. I think Jesus understands. Peter is saying, I left my nets. I dropped everything to follow you. Matthew, the guy we don't even really like, he left the tax collector's booth. Like he left everything to follow you. We left our house. We left our homes. We left our land. We we left our families behind and we get nothing. And Jesus in verses uh, uh, um, 26 and 27, uh, what, what he says here is like, no, no, you will receive a hundred times that amount in this age and the age to come. But this is hard to follow Jesus. It's difficult to do this. This isn't just something you can just wake up one day and be like, okay, let's do this thing. Like this is hard and difficult. Bonhoeffer says it well. He says, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Truly following Jesus, becoming a disciple of Jesus will cost your life. This is why the gospel is good news. Jesus knew you could not do this on your own. There's no way that you could be good enough to stand before a holy and righteous judge and be declared you can enter into everlasting life. Jesus knew this. And so he left heaven for you. And he lived a perfect life, become the the sinless lamb on the cross to be the final sacrifice, to be the atoning sacrifice, to be the propitiation from God's wrath. He was willing to do it all for you because he's driven by love and driven to love so, so well. That he rose from the grave, he defeated death and he defeated the enemy. And he will call us home one day. This is good news. And it's only found in Christ. Jesus lastly reminds his disciples, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus is saying, don't be impressed with your own righteousness. Because if I'm not a part of it, he, he's saying God's timing may not be yours, but the gift of everlasting life is eternal. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a great week. Love you guys. See you soon. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out just for a few extra minutes. I want to go over the transformational moment with you. Um, what has following Jesus cost you? What I love about this question is that it's not a yes or no. It's a specific question. What has following Jesus cost you? I've heard it said that if it hasn't cost you anything, are you truly following Jesus? 
And this message isn't to condemn, isn't to uh, be uh, um, hurtful in any way. But my hope is that this message really convicts us. Has following Jesus cost me anything? And if not, what do I need to remove or give to him so that I can truly begin to follow him? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for you. Thank you that you left heaven for me. Thank you that you left perfection for my friends and that you have a plan of salvation for each and every one of us. Help us to um, trust in you more so that we're willing or able, or even in our mind, willing and able to hand you the thing that's in front of you from us. Help us to trust you more and more and more and believe in you more and more and more so we can get to that place of that when people see us, they see how you are changing us from the inside out. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. We trust all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye guys.